Hello, welcome to the Hot Seat. I'm Martin Rogers, here with Professor Simon Hicks to talk about Britain's referendum on its EU membership. Welcome, Simon. Hi. So first of all, now that the local elections are out of the way, the focus of British politics has moved on to the EU referendum. So what's an overview of where we are at the moment? Well, I think you're right. That people have been waiting for the local elections to be over. Now the really serious campaign starts, and I think we're now starting to see the real splits and the type of uh, content of the campaigns emerging. So we're seeing the Remain campaign emphasising uh, economics and security concerns and the Leave campaign emphasising immigration and control of borders. And we're going to see those messages repeated from now until 23rd of June. So it's perhaps difficult to get an idea of polling, the accuracy of polling, given the lack of precedent. But what are polls showing at the moment? Well, the, the average of recent polls uh, and the people who are doing the polling, the poll of polls, so pooling polls over, over several weeks, are showing that it's 50-50, it's very tight. What's interesting is that the phone polls tend to have a, a, a big or a small lead now for the Remain side, and the internet polls have, until recently, had a, a small lead for the Leave campaign. We still don't quite understand why that is the case. They're so clearly sampling different types of people. But what's interesting is both the phone polls and the leave, uh, both the phone polls and the internet polls are, are converging, and so both of them are showing it being a really close, tight race. Now, one of the things that has the potential to decide this race is demographics and turnouts. So there's quite a clear demographic split between um, various groups of so older people are more likely to vote to leave, people without um, degrees are more likely to back leave but the turnout of different groups younger people more likely to back staying less likely to turn out to vote how is that likely to play out this could be quite decisive yeah, couldn't it and it, it, it's not easy to to really predict this because yes you're right one factor is age and so what we know is that older people um, are far more supportive of us leaving the eu than younger people are so over 60s as opposed to under 25s um, and older people are far more likely to vote so in the last uh, general election last year the national turnout was around 65%, it was over 75% for over 60s, and it was only around 45% for under 25s. But the, another factor, of course, is income, and we know that higher income groups are more in favour of staying than lower income groups, and higher income groups are more likely to vote than lower income groups. But what's interesting is the age factor is a much bigger predictor of, of turnout than income is. So one of the key questions that's going to determine the outcome of the, of the referendum is whether or not under 25s are going to come out and vote. If there's a very high turnout, say in the 70s or even higher, then I think the under 25s will come out and vote and then we could actually see more likely to be a vote for Remain. If it's a very low turnout, let's say in the 50s, it means overwhelmingly the under 25s have stayed home and over 60s have still come out to vote. And if that's the case, we're more likely to vote to leave. Is there any lessons that can be learned from the Scottish referendum with um, relatively large turnout, large engagement of um, younger people, which the Remain campaign would like to see in this referendum? I mean, well, there's several differences, of course. Um, one, of the, one of the differences is the ground campaign. There was a much more active ground campaign for independence in Scotland by the Scottish National Party. Um, it's not clear whether or not we're going to see such dynamic and forceful ground campaigns as sort of door knocking and leafleting. We've not seen so much of that up to now. We might see that in the last few weeks of the election. But it's the door knocking that really ultimately gets people out up to vote and turns it into a high turnout. We, we talk about an air campaign being fought on the radio and the TV and in the national newspapers and a ground campaign, which is the door knocking and the leafleting. And we're now starting, uh, now that the local elections are over, is going to be the question, both sides are going to ramp up that ground campaign. And that ultimately, will, I think, will decide whether or not we're going to see high turnout on the day. So to, to move on then to the, um, the prospect if we do leave. So what if we were to vote to leave, what are Britain's realistic prospects? What are the realistic alternatives that we could um, become part of if we were to leave? Well, there's really two major types of alternatives. One alternative is that we would try and stay in the European single market and try and maintain access to the European single market. This is a, a model that Norway and Switzerland have. They're not in the EU, but they have access to the single market. But in return for access to the single market, they have to have two things. They have to accept pretty much everything the EU does in terms of laws and regulations to those single markets, and they have to accept the free movement of people. 
So the other alternative now seems to be far more popular amongst the most people in the Leave campaign, which is to say we leave the EU, we leave the single market altogether, and we negotiate a, a special agreement with the EU, for example, an EU-UK free trade agreement. But one of the limitations of a free trade agreement, it only gives you limited access back into the single market. So the types of trade-offs here are how much access do we want back into the European economy versus how much restrictions do we want on migration. And that, and that is going to be the key trade-off. To get more access to the market, you're going to have to allow more immigration. And to have more control over immigration, you're going to get less access to the market. And so that is the key trade-off, I think. And we're probably going to be faced with that choice if we vote to leave. So you think that there will be a clear link between the access tariffs that we will be subject to and our openness to immigration via the free movement of UK, uh, EU citizens. citizens. Yeah, so uh, the single market rules are basically free movement of goods, services, capital and labour. And the EU has not done any deal with any other non-EU member state that gives people full access for their goods, services and capital without also demanding that there's free movement, reciprocal free movement of people. So a free trade agreement is something very different to a single market. A free trade agreement says, here is a deal between two countries or two trade blocks that says we are going to trade freely without any tariffs in this set of goods and services. And, and so how long is a piece of string? How comprehensive is that deal? Most free trade agreements are actually relatively narrow. And so one key issue for Britain is will there be financial services access? Will the City of London still continue to be able to provide and sell financial services throughout the rest of the EU? Currently, London is the centre of the European financial services industry. If we left the EU, could that still be the case? The EU has not ever signed a free trade agreement with anybody that covers financial services. So that's a, one of the key issues. If we did leave, London, the City of London would be campaigning for a kind of Norway option. But I'm sure that would then, so they're going to have that tension. Do we want financial services freedom within the single market against the people who say part of the whole reason we left is so we could re -con take con back control over immigration? So to move on to the prospects if we were to stay, um, is the EU likely to see significant reform if we do choose to, if we do choose to yeah, stay? Yeah, I, I think here a lot of it, thinking about Britain and the relationship between Britain and the EU going forward if we vote to remain, um, a lot of that depends on how big that majority is. If it's a very small majority, then I think it, the issue won't be off the table. It'll come back again. So, you know, three, four, five percent difference between the two sides, let's say. And I think there'll be a big question mark hanging over Britain and Britain's relationship with the rest of the EU. Well, this is just the beginning. There's going to be another referendum and there's still big questions. Is Britain really committed to the project? Is Britain really going to continue as a partner? Um, alternatively, if we vote to remain and it's like a 10 point margin or bigger, then I think a different type of questions come up, which is Britain has voted to stay in the EU. Is Britain now going to retake a leadership role? Britain, the perception in Brussels and Paris and London is that Britain for the last 10 years has kind of opted out of EU politics, let other people run the EU. Britain's standing on the sidelines, whether it's the migration crisis, whether it's the EU uh, Eurozone crisis, we'll, we'll let Germany and France deal with these things. I think the big question, if we do vote to remain by a big margin, is is Britain, what, what is the British government going to do to try and retake a leadership role in the EU and back like it did in the 1980s, like it did in part of the 1990s? What prospects are there for the, the EU itself, either way, whether Britain votes to leave or stay? Could this, if we were to leave, is that likely to have a domino effect? Or even if we vote to stay, is there likely to be a sort of chain reaction of referendums around the EU? Very good question. Uh, I think we are likely to see chain reactions either way. There's already a debate in Denmark, for example, about Denmark having a Cameron-style referendum, the Danish People's Party, a populist party, a bit like UKIP in Denmark, would like to have a similar referendum in Denmark. Um, there's discussions in other member states. If we vote to leave, I think Paris and Berlin, will. the biggest thing they will fear is a kind of a domino effect, and particularly if they then negotiate a very generous free trade agreement with the UK. Because if, if there's then a quick deal to say Britain's voted to leave, Britain get, gets access back to the single market, some kind of generous deal... Well, Denmark can, will say, well, hey, we want the same, and Sweden will say, we want the same, and how about Austria and, and Hungary and the Czech Republic and so on. So uh, I think you've, there's a balance between an economic interest of the EU, which is to say that we want, would want to do a deal with Britain. Britain would represent 16% of total EU exports. Britain would be the EU's largest trading partner. So there would be an incentive to do a deal with Britain. 
But on the other side, there'll be political incentives against that because they'd say, we cannot be seen to be doing a generous deal with Britain because if we do, there will be a domino effect. So I think what, if we do vote to leave, we're going to be in a very difficult situation for a few years because politically a lot of the elites on the continent are not going to want to do a good deal with Britain. Equally, if we vote to stay, I think, again, there could potentially be contagion and there will be a debate around Europe about how is that contagion going to be limited? What is going to be the response to potentially demand in a lot of other member states for, for a British-type referendum and a British-type solution? Because Cameron is perceived to have negotiated a special status for Britain in the EU. If we vote to stay, other member states are going to say, we want the same status as the UK. So to move on to Britain's domestic politics, is it true that the Labour Party and especially Labour Party voters will be key in deciding the outcome of this referendum? It is true. Um, what we know in the opinion polls is among Labour voters, it's about 80% are in favour of remaining, 20% are in favour of leaving. It's around 50-50 in Conservatives. Most polls showing slight majorities in the Conservatives. This is part why it's been the debate has been within the Conservative Party largely, with the leaders on both sides being Conservatives. So the key thing, I think, is going to be how mobilised are those Labour voters going to be? How many of them are going to want to come out to vote to remain when that also means voting with Cameron? They've got to make a choice. Do we support Cameron or do we support Boris? A lot of Labour voters don't like that kind of choice. So I think it's going to be the, the, the onus is going to be on the Labour remain campaigners to make it to go out and campaign, why should their voters come out and vote to remain? And why is this a Labour choice to remain, not a choice to support Cameron? And what future will the Conservative Party have? It's in a difficult position, it's split over the EU. Is there a chance of it being able to reconcile its differences um, with the prospect of some, like returning to proper government after the referendum? Yeah. <laughs> I think, again, that depends a little bit on the outcome. So I think if we vote to leave, I think uh, the leave wing within the Conservative Party will see themselves as the natural leadership of the Conservative Party. They'll say a majority of Conservative voters, a majority of Conservative constituency associations, a majority of Conservative MPs, if given a free vote, would have been in favour of leaving. We are the natural leadership of the Conservative Party. If we vote to stay, I think, again, it depends on how big that margin is. If it's a small margin, I think that split is going to carry on with the party. It's going to be very difficult to resolve it. I think what, what Cameron is hoping is there's a big vote to remain, 10% point vote to remain, and he can say, I did the right thing, I lanced the boil within the party, let's bring it back together because we have to win the next general election. And then I think some of the Leave campaigners in the party will say, I'm not going to pack up and go home, I'm going to carry on campaigning. But a lot of the more moderate elements of the party, for example, Boris Johnson, I think he'll inevitably have to say at that point, OK, he'll, he'll probably be able to say, it was appropriate we had this debate, it was important that I stood and we had this debate, but I'm happy to come back into the cabinet and work together with David Cameron so we can win the next election. Great. Thank you very much, Simon. Have a thought, Thank you.